I so want to say the word phlegm right now, <clears throat> but I'm not going to. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> I need to breathe. Okay. <clears throat> when serendipity and synchronicity meet at the intersection of wow and boo, magic and miracles do show up. Summer, 1986. I had just gone through a jag, a plethora, a ton of workshops and seminars about finding the one. If there even was one to find, or if there wasn't the one to find, at least I'd be okay with that. And I was. I was okay with that. I envision myself at 90, 95, 100, a wild, devil-may-care gypsy, free-spirited, untethered, a wise woman sage with a horde, a posse, a gaggle of handsome, virile, sexually adventurous young men willing to service me whenever wherever and however I chose. That was a comforting thought. If I was to be alone, so be it. And by the way, at the time I was dating up a, a storm of lust. Nothing serious, but let's just say I was very, very popular. <laughs> My friend Helen called and invited me to go to an event with her. She was starring in a play about AIDS, and this was going to be a big fundraiser for the AIDS community. It was being hosted by Elizabeth Taylor and Ted Danson. Okay, okay, that sounds like fun. By late August of 1986, I was beginning to feel like a lot of things were late. I wanted to find the one. I was tired of dating, going through the cycle of the cute meat, infatuation, disillusionment, uncomfortable and painful breakup, then rinse and repeat again and again and again. I had been a consciousness junkie for over a decade and done just about every seminar that you could imagine. I had done Est, Schmest, and all the rest. <laughs> then I did a seminar called Making Love Work, which was supposed to be a seminar to make relationships functional, but it felt more like it was making love a chore, you know, making love work. I tried another seminar, this one on Native American spiritual sexuality. Interesting theory, amazing practicum, but no woman, no how. Desperation <laughs> led me to a precursor uh, to speed dating, and I called it the 15-minute coffee date. I figured I could squeeze in three or four in an evening. The only result was kidney stones from too much coffee. I even tried to use a phallic-shaped crystal as an imaginary fly fishing rod to cast a line into the Los Angeles dating pool and reel in my soulmate, but nothing. Out of the blue, a friend invited me to an AIDS benefit. And she said she bought a table, and she asked if I would like to go have dinner and be part of an interesting evening. <coughs> I didn't really want to go, but I figured, what the heck? I was in show business. What respectable actor or writer ever turned down to free dinner? So it's the day of the event, and my friend Helen calls and tells me that I have to go to this AIDS benefit alone. Alone? Really? Why? She then tells me she got an unexpected call to go to New York immediately to do a movie of the week. And then she said, look, dinner is paid for. You'll have a delicious, vegetarian, overcooked, soggy vegetable plate, just like you like. You'll be at the head table with the gay mafia, surrounded by lots of other gay men who will absolutely adore you. Throw on your vintage rhinestone bracelets, put a big bow in your hair, slap on some red lipstick, lipstick and go. You are going, just go. Go. Downtown to the Biltmore Hotel alone. 
Okay. So I got all dolled up, went over to my mom's for the once over. She went on and on about how adorable I looked, how darling I was, and how, how brave I was to go to this van event alone. So I drive downtown to the Biltmore Hotel and suddenly realize, oops, where am I supposed to park? I didn't bring any money. The night was already paid for. So there I was alone in a very, very bad part of downtown LA. It was just me, Skid Row, and Pershing Square, filled with homelessness, wino dumb, and danger. I had to park at the hotel. So I took a deep breath, <sighs> pulled into valet parking. There was no self-parking. Oh no, I checked and it was $10 with a validation. I prayed for a little miracle. I walked into the hotel and there was my miracle, my old friend Vince, who was now working as a cameraman for ABC News. He spotted me the $10 for parking and I was good to go. I folded that $10 bill tightly and shoved it into my purse and I smiled, knowing that my gift of finding serendipity and synchronicity was still alive and well and making its usual magic. I arrived early at the elegant Biltmore Hotel in downtown Los Angeles. I like to be early so I could scope out the sitch to give me the illusion that I was in control of something in my life. Of course, I wouldn't be in control, not really. In fact, being early might only give me more opportunities to stumble into embarrassing circumstances where I could brilliantly demonstrate how little control I actually had. The evening began in a smaller than grand ballroom where wine and crudité were served. I grabbed a wine and worked with the carrots from the hors d'oeuvre platter. Experience taught me that celery always had a hidden pothole of problems with those stringy ribs that can get caught and make you tzatz for the rest of the night while you try to get that celery floss out from between your teeth. People started showing up. In my mind, I was a suave, debonair cross between Sean Connery and Cary Grant, standing there with my wine in one hand and my carrots in another. As I surveyed the room, my highly trained senses were like high-tech radar, alert, Focused, sensitized, and attuned. Extrasensory antenna scanning the horizon. A heat-seeking love bomb searching for anyone who might look interesting to talk to. I entered the bar next to the ballroom where the dinner would be and wondered how to while away some time without having a drink to fiddle with. I figured I'd just stick with the carrots and hope I wouldn't have any orange flecks stuck between my teeth. And then out of the corner of my eye, I thought I recognized a familiar face. Who, who was that? God, I know that face. Ooh, ooh, and it's coming toward me. Then I saw her, an attractive brunette with sparkling eyes in a long black velvet dress holding a napkin full of carrots. <laughs> she was pretty, yes, but she looked familiar. And we already had carrots in common. Suddenly, I realized a miraculous thing. I did know her. Yes, the pretty face belonged to a casting director who, if memory served me, liked my work. I had had a great audition with her just a little while back, and uh, this was perfect. All I had to do was walk across the floor, say hello, and engage her in conversation. Then she would tell me that she was casting a new series, and there was a small part for which I would be right. I would get the part, be brilliant, inspire the show to write me into a recurring role. <laughs> the recurring role would lead to my own series, an Emmy, films, and an Oscar. It was a done deal. All I had to do was simply walk across the floor, say hello, and my future was made. The hell with my soulmate, this was show business. I watched as this tall, lean, handsome, well-dressed, salt-and-pepper, curly-haired guy sauntered across the room, clearly heading in my direction. Then, for one split second, it looked like he hesitated and was going to veer off. Just then, I remembered his name, Richard. 
I confidently took my first sure-footed step across the floor, buoyed by the indisputable fact that my entire future career was now on solid footing. <laughs> Three steps out, my confidence weakened. Wait, did that pretty face belong to a casting director? Five steps out, I had my answer. No. I was wrong, <laughs> really wrong. It wasn't a casting director. But who was it? She looked so familiar. Well, I didn't want to look like a complete idiot, so I prepared to veer off to the right and head to the bar for a refill. But right before my veer, the woman looked directly at me, smiled, and nodded in recognition. I was stuck. I had to go over and say hello. Each step was like the Bataan death march, bringing me closer and closer to humiliation. Who was it? Who was it? Finally, I had a flash. One letter, a great big capital R, but nothing else, just a single solitary R. I casually walked up and said to this familiar stranger in my most suave debonair voice, hi. You're a Ruri Rolla. Rolla, like a, a cheer for LA. Ra and La. Rolla. Yes, Rolla. And you're Richard. Yes, I am Richard. We knew each other in the Groundlings, remember? Right. Oh, he was cute. Last time I had seen him was eight years before. He was crush material back then, but at the time, my boyfriend was Gary Austin, the guy who had created the Groundlings. But oh, was Richard adorable. He was a skinny, tousled, curly-haired mop top, turtleneck wearing, very talented and very funny guy who had just come out from New York with his best friend Bobby Hedges, who played Juan Epstein on Welcome Back, Cotter. We had been in the Groundlings eight years earlier. We were in an improvisational song class together where you're thrown a line and a musical style. Country Western, your socks are too tight. And you have to make up a song on the spot. Then I remembered her boyfriend was Gary Austin, our director and the guy who created the Groundlings. Since she wasn't a casting director and my future career hopes were now destroyed, I easily shifted to a new tack. She was so pretty and had such a great smile and such a wonderful happy air about her. I casually asked the only question I was really interested in that point. So, are you still going with Gary? No, we broke up, well, we broke up four years ago. So, we easily chatted and yakked about all kinds of things and it was nice, but I wasn't compelled to change where I was sitting at dinner to have more time with him. And he got a kick out of the fact that the Helen who invited me and would have been my date was Helen Hunt. Toward the end of the night, Richard came to the table, asked me for my number, and if I'd like to get together. The benefit was on Monday night, August 25th, 1986. I didn't want to look too eager, so I waited a whole two days before I called her. Wednesday night, he called and asked me out for Saturday. Three months later, we got engaged. Six months later, we were married. Helen was a bridesmaid in my wedding. Three and a half years later, our son Chase was born. This May 31st, we'll be celebrating 29 years of marriage. And it was all very simple. Serendipity and synchronicity, meeting at the intersection of wow and boo. That, that brings the unexpected puzzle pieces of life together in unplanned surprise. We first met in an improv class, but this event that neither of us really wanted to attend brought two star-crossed soulmates together for the second time. And this time we married and began a life of adventure where laughter is our aphrodisiac. How, How lucky, lucky can, can two, two people, people get? get?